Okay. So um, thanks everyone for joining us this morning. My name is Amanda Hargit and I'm the Outreach Specialist for AgriAbility Wisconsin. I am assuming that most of you are with us yesterday as I'm recognizing some names as I'm admitting people in. So um, we're not going to give a, a huge introduction today, um, but I do just want to say if there is anyone new joining us, uh, AgriAbility Wisconsin is a partnership between UW Extension and Easter Seals of Wisconsin. And we've been around for 30 years, helping over 3,000 farmers here in Wisconsin, with, um, farmers with disabilities. And I uh, appreciate DVR being a, a partner as well with us. Um, I see Jeff is on from Easter Seals. I'm not sure if he has anything he wants to say this morning, if he just wants to say good morning to everyone. Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me, Amanda? Yep. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. Um, the one thing I wanted to say, just based on yesterday's um, conversation, and again, glad to see everyone, um, so many joining us again today, was that the purpose, and correct me if I'm wrong, though it was on the planning meeting, was that the purpose of these were to provide a um, kind of day in the life of a farm or a snapshot of a farm. Um, in today's thing, we're talking about crops, and thank you, Josh, for doing this. Um, it's not necessarily to talk about what is or what is not assistive technology on a farm, but just to provide an overview on farms uh, for, the, for those people who, who may or um, um, not have a lot of experience with that. Um, so just wanted to kind of clarify that part. And, um, and again, um, welcome everyone. Great, thanks, Jeff. All right, with that, I will hand it over to Josh Camps. Um, he did give a little introduction in our chat, but he is an agriculture educator from Lafayette County in Southwest Wisconsin, and he's going to be talking about crop production um, and giving an introduction to that and some farm safety. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Josh. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda, um, Brian, and Jeff for the opportunity uh, to, to bring this conversation to, to you all um, to hopefully help benefit your work. Um, I will work, work through these slides. I merged a few presentations together. So please, you know, let, let me know any, any questions. Go ahead and use, use the chat. If you have something we want to talk about more, uh, that's what I would like to talk about today. Still working here. There we go. So just a few quick slides here first about cooperative extension. Uh, perhaps this was covered yesterday, so I'll be I'll be really brief. But um, it's that partnership between the land grant universities. So in Wisconsin, it's UW Madison and the counties. Um, as you can see, it began kind of in an informal fashion uh, in the early 1800s. Uh, more formalized in the early 1900s with um, some USDA type leg legislation. So a few pictures of the things that that I get to work on. Uh, when I'm working with farmers out in the field, um, we're working on uh, corn production, uh, other types of crops as well, cover crops, and the opportunity the opportunity to do some youth ed education. Uh, the little calf there was part of a day at the dairy program that we worked on. Uh, the extension system in Wisconsin, just briefly, um, we're broken into different uh, program areas, dairy, livestock, crops and soils, farm management, horticulture. Um, and I am down in area 17. So Grant Green, Iowa and Lafayette counties is my area. I'm the crops and soils educator um, for Lafayette County and for that area. Uh, so um, excited and thankful to be a part of Extension. A uh, couple, couple more slides here. We really like to um, offer that research-based uh, practical information, um, try to be you know, proven and reliable and trustworthy. And you know, bring that bring that service to people that maybe haven't had the ability to to receive some of that accessibility um, and that information to help with their help with their farming decisions. Uh, a few groups that we serve: farmers, ranchers, ag business, um, a tractor safety here example down on the bottom left. I'm excited to be part of that program every year for the youth, and we'll take a look at that just a little bit. I pulled up part of the tractor safety curriculum. Uh, when we talk about farm safety, I thought that was a good spot um, to go. So cover, cover crops, we're thinking about crop production uh, here in Wisconsin, Southwest Wisconsin. Uh, if, you, if you've heard this term, it, it really is any plant that is, that is used uh, between, 
maybe a grain production or a head of uh, maybe a, another type of forage production. And they have multiple purposes. We'll, we'll take a look at that just a little bit later. But the, the, the goal is to protect the soil and also to stimulate the soil microbiology. So when I'm working with farmers and, and answering some of the questions about cover crops, there, there sometimes are examples and experiences where the, the result wasn't maybe as favorable as desired. Um, but this is a change of management for the farms. We're often looking at reducing tillage at the same time as using cover, cover crops. Uh, so for instance, on the left-hand side, these are some summer annual cover crops. So they were planted in uh, early August. Um, these are, are plants that were selected to uh, help stimulate the soil for next year's crop, help fix some nit nitrogen from the atmosphere to provide for next year's crop. Uh, compared to the far right, that is a winter annual crop. So that's cereal rye that's planted in the fall and then it comes back to life in the spring and grabs some of the nitrogen in our soil profiles and also protects the soil surface ahead of planting our, our next cash crop. So, Cover crops are, are a big conversation item. We're, we're learning more and more about them, how they can benefit our agricultural systems from a nutrient management standpoint, from a soil quality and soil uh, erosion reduction standpoint. A few pictures here. Um, I have some interest in, in soils. It's really the foundation of, of agriculture, uh, crops, animal production, um, everything. But, this is what we can expect that goes on below that soil surface. Uh, so we have uh, that, that living root um, helps to feed the soil microbes. Uh, and then in turn, the soil microbes benefit that, benefit that plant with that symbiotic rela relationship. So different rooting structures, uh, different purposes in the soil. But um, one thing that, that, that farmers um, are, are interested in is learning more about you know, we, we can see what these cover crops do on the soil surface, but what are they doing uh, below that below that soil, um, topsoil level? And our re researchers at Madison are, are helping answer some of those questions. Uh, a few more examples here, um, actually crops that are planted directly into cover crops is called planting green. So we have a cover crop that's actively growing, as you see on the bottom. Picture there, kind of a little bit of a hazy picture. That's some winter cereal rye that uh, was planted the fall before, and then alfalfa was directly planted into that in the spring. You can see the little alfalfa plants, the seedlings there starting um, on that bottom right. So trying to uh, really encourage the uh, reducing tillage, uh, keeping something growing in, the, in, our, in our fields, and then introducing our next crop um, before we terminate the crop um, that was planted there as that, as that cover crop. A few things on pest management here. Uh, we have um, some pigweeds in southern Wisconsin that are becoming a problem. Uh, the picture here is water hemp. Um, I consider myself a fairly tall person and that water hemp uh, towers, towers above me. So that is a pigweed. Uh, one, of the, one of the main um, uh, invasive type species that we're really working on and Farmers were, were helping with uh, some understanding with identification. There's some herbicide re resistance that's being built, built into these. Uh, just because of the, the species of plant, they're able to uh, produce a really large genetic diversity. And then the seed production, as you can see in the middle, there's tiny seeds, hundreds of thousands of seeds out of that plant that I have in the picture. Um, I, I didn't have a $100 bill the day that I took the picture of the size of that leaf. So I just had to use a one, but um, a very, a very large plant, very capable of filling its, its area and uh, producing uh, in, in a short period of time. So, so th this is water hemp. Uh, it is one of the pigweed species that we are um, working on with farmers. Uh, and this is Palmer amaranth. Unfortunately, we found this in Lafayette County this year. Uh, this plant is not native uh, some of the water hemp plants uh, species are native. Palmer amaranth is not. Um, the distinguishing characteristic is that tall serpent type seed head. Uh, this plant is a real beast. Uh, our, our, weed, our weed specialist is very, very concerned and aware, and we're trying to contain 
this population, there, there's other populations in the state as well. Uh, but uh, weed control, uh, resi herbicide resistant weed control uh, is definitely on, on farmers' minds and something that we're wor working on. Um, building that identification ability, um, you know, into all of, all of our, our uh, agronomists and crop consultants and farmers uh, so we can have more eyes in the field to try to find these situations uh, and keep them contained. Okay, uh, just a little introduction there, some of the programs that, that we work on here in Lafayette County. I'm going to just take a little bit broader uh, stroke here for a few minutes and and please feel free, Brian, Amanda, to interrupt if I uh, skirted over something that you know there appears to be a little more interest in. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna talk about crop production uh, from a little bit higher view, and we're thinking about the inputs of crop production, uh, decisions that that farmers make every every year, whether they're planting an annual crop or whether they're planting, uh, excuse me, or if they're caring for a crop that's more of a perennial na nature like alfalfa. For instance, um, where we have kind of an upfront investment, and then we have inputs then throughout the life of that stand. But this nutrient management program is, is a big piece that extension uh, brings research and knowledge and recommendations. Uh, depending on the farm size, uh, farmers will utilize the nutrient management program as part of their um, DACAP compliance, their DNR compliance, or they, they can use this nutrient management program as an elective. Uh, to help them uh, help them with their bottom line. Uh, uh, so that's one of the input uh, tools that we consider is the, the nutrients that we have. Um, also, the, there's um, some budgeting spreadsheets we'll, we'll take a look, look at. Um, gives us a chance to enter our seed costs and our, our herbicide costs and our land rent costs. And we can really uh, help make more informed decisions of our cropping uh, systems. So. We'll take a look at that budget spreadsheet tool that is available, um, essential versus non-essential inputs and conservation goals. So a few items that are a little bit more difficult to maybe put an exact number on as farmers are making these decisions. But um, something that I guess I wanted to share with, with the group uh, that farmers are constantly thinking about as they get uh, either updates you know, from their crop consultants or they're getting yield updates when they're harvesting you know, how can we do a little bit different or better job next year to control our inputs um, to really maximize uh, the profit on our crop farms? So just a little bit more about that nutrient management concept. Uh, it's, it's a term that I think can mean a lot of things to different people, but uh, we're really trying to focus on, you know, knowing what's in our soil profile. So we're doing uh, four-year soil samples on, on all the fields that are entered into one of these programs. Every, every four years, those fields are resampled. And we're, we're really trying to manage that source rate, time, and place of fertilizer. Um, we were, we're aware of some of the groundwater quality concerns in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, nitrogen is one of those um, uh, risks, one of those uh, nutrients that, that is fairly volatile and can, and can leach into our groundwater system. So when we're thinking about the source rate, time, and place of nit nitrogen, uh, we, we, we do want to be very aware that that nutrient, you know, needs to be applied as close to when that crop needs, needs to take it up as possible. Um, kind of an interesting piece. We, we hear about nitrate in water, um, actually nitrate and ammonium are, are the two forms of nitrogen that plants can utilize. So we really need that nitrogen cycle to happen in our soils. We do need that breakdown of organic nitrogen into nitrate. But when it gets to that form, we need to have a crop that's there growing to be able to take that up. So just a little piece there about that nitrogen cycle and why we're really thinking about nutrient management in Wisconsin and, and across the country. But the SNAP Plus program is, is the program within Wisconsin. It's a computer-based program. I'm not gonna get into it a lot, but there'll be a couple more slides here. Uh, where we can learn about this tool that's available to farmers and agronomists and crop consultants to really make a more informed nutrient application decision. So here is that SNAP Plus program. It's housed within UW-Madison, a uh, partnership there between UW-Madison and Department of, of Ag. Um, some of the things that we can enter into it, the, those baseline soil test reports, a county soil survey, 
Uh, so we can we have an idea of the soil, the quality of the soil, the nutrients in the soil before we're making any of these nutrient additions to our to our fields. And then we're putting that research data back into that as well. The yield, the nutrient, and soil data um, is is going back in. So we can we can give a recommendation based off of a yield goal, um, based off of a soil quality, a realistic um, profitable type nutrient application for our crop production field. So that's that's SNAP Plus Soil Nutrient Application Planner. That'll be on the test later. I'm pretty sure. Um, a few pieces here about. Um, SNAP plus, um, just a couple more points. UW recommendations are built in there for fertilizers. So we can have that confidence that the, the information that is in uh, this program, you know, has that profitability built in, but also has that uh, respect for uh, nature, for uh, nutrient, nutrient loss as well and water and water quality. Okay, here's a little printout of just one of the one of the sheets is actually uh, one of my wife and I's farms. Um, um, so we can see uh, all kinds of things going on here, right? So um, just very brie briefly, um, there's some yield goal estimates here uh, for this alfalfa grass crop as we switch into a, a corn grain rotation. Um, our definitely our yields change and our crop needs change. We, we aren't putting any nitrogen on this alfalfa crop. Um, that's because nitrogen, excuse me, that's because alfalfa is a leg, legume and it's able to fix its own ni ni nitrogen from the atmosphere. So that definitely has a profitability piece when we're considering crop production and crop rotation. Whereas we get into a corn production system and we are adding nitrogen, uh, whether it's coming from manure. Um, here we receive some from a legume credit actually from last year from the alfalfa. So we're balancing that out and uh, then coming up with the uh, additions out that we add, whether it's manure or commercial fertilizer. Okay, uh, this budget spreadsheet is another one of those tools that I mentioned. Uh, this, is, this happens to be available within uh, UW-Madison. It's updated right regularly. There's other state extensions that also have um, some type of these budget spreadsheets, but just a little snapshot here. Uh, where we can take a look at all of our entries, what some of our costs are, uh, a little bit of a breakdown here, where uh, if things adjust one way or the other, um, if our prices go down, if our prices go up, what that does to our profitability per acre. Um, the current, current prices are, are actually much, much higher for grains this year. Uh, we are looking at uh, closer to that $6 and, uh, and above price on corn. Um, and that's what and that's what this analysis is here for corn production in Wisconsin. So tools that, that farmers are aware of and part of their decision making process with crop production is definitely, uh, you know, what's what's the chance of that profitability uh, within our cropping system. A couple pieces here. I like this the picture here from our farm, which helps helps me identify I guess the risk, right? So we were using this budget spreadsheet for the, trying to figure out the cost of production, um, comparing multiple decisions at once with that final decision then of what's the risk. So for these little beef calves, what, what is the risk of crossing that water compared to what's the re reward of the de decision? So most likely there's some fresh milk on the other side of the stream there. If they can just, if they can, their mothers can just convince them to, to, to cross. Okay, uh, we talked a little bit about the essential and non-essential uh, pieces of crop production. So this is a Martin rates guide. So maximum return to nitrogen, this is built into that SNAP plus program, uh, also part of that budget spreadsheet. Uh, so it's, it's given us these, these ranges of nitrogen application for corn uh, with that goal in mind of what's, what's essential and what is non-essential. Um, so we're taking a look at our soils. We're in a high yield potential soil, for instance. Um, if we had um, uh, corn as a previous crop, we can go across and then see what the recommended nitrogen rate is uh, to give us that um, expected yield return based off of the price of nitrogen and the price and the price of corn. So th this is a tool that's available. Um, used use across the Midwest for nutrient uh, for nitrogen application rates 
um, different by field, different by crop rotation, um, but really trying to, to get in get in that that fact of what's an essential crop input and what is a non-essential crop input. Another example here of how the Martin tool works in Wisconsin. We won't get into that uh, too much here, but balances that, that soil quality um, over on this side and then balances that price of nitrogen and, and the price of corn um, to give us that optimum rate. Okay, and crop protection is a huge piece uh, as, as well. Um, we're really trying to keep these plants healthy. There's disease risk, there's insect risk, there's weed pressure. We saw a few of those pictures earlier on. Uh, this is a picture of some white mold and soybeans on the bottom. Um, and that is northern corn leaf blight in corn. Um, so, you know, what, what are these crop production inputs from an essential versus non-essential standpoint? Farmers are thinking about this and making these decisions. We really recommend that extension to use uh, field scouting, um, try to identify those economic thresholds. And then you know mon monitor those crops and identify the pest. So you know, do we have enough of the pests in the field that is going to cause significant damage that we should go ahead and put a treatment out? Um, some sort of pesticide perhaps to eliminate either the, the weed, the insect, um, or the disease, or perhaps there's um, some other opportunities that we can take with increasing the nutrition that's available to that plant so that it can better compete with whatever that pest pressure is. Okay, a, a quick switch here. Um, just a little piece about technology and essential versus non-essential. Uh, so this is a autonomous tractor. Uh, maybe, maybe something that we see more in the future, but uh, this type of tech technology would allow an, an operator to, to manage and uh, still be in charge of this field application, this, this planting, this planting application, uh, but not but not be there personally in the vehicle, uh, excuse me, in that piece of equipment doing that, doing that work. So interesting piece as we're thinking about uh, sort of thinking about the vocation of people and the ability for people to, to work and to farm, um, some of these tech technology that's available may be very beneficial. Okay, just a little piece about conservation goals. Um, so it's a very important re resource that we spoke about, our, our soil. Uh, we wanna keep it in place, we wanna keep it fertile, and we wanna keep the nutrients available for the crop that's growing. So um, a, few, a few goals there that I have uh, listed, reduce that soil erosion, try to limit the nutrient movement. Uh, we wanna try to improve soil health. So, in crop production, in livestock production, it's all, it all goes back to soil. Soil quality, soil health um, really drives profitability for farmers, drives long-term uh, community interactions with farms. Uh, so that's, that's our goal here uh, within this managing inputs piece. Okay, we talked a little bit about cover crops. I uh, just wanted to share this image with you about some of the benefits of cover crops. Um, Take a look at that Swiss Army knife. All those things are factors that we can consider when we use cover crops in our system. Okay, reduce soil compaction, um, help control weeds, build soil organic matter. Okay, so these all have a, a economic benefit to our farms um, if we can learn some of the management strategy necessary to be able uh, to, to use these cover crops. And nutrient movement, we spoke a little bit about nitrogen um, and how that really is on the forefront in our, in our state when we're thinking about groundwater quality, surface water quality, um, really uh, promote and, and ask farmers to be accountable for their nutrient um, application decisions. You know, are, we, are we using these nu nutrients at the right time when there's crops that are available to uptake them? If we are gonna put some nutrient out uh, at a time when there's not a growing crop, do we have the ability to have a cover, cover crop there to help stabilize that nutrient source? Um, really looking to keep the nutrients available to the crop, but not at risk of, of loss. Okay, and then a little bit about soil health as well. Um, we've got a few, a few things around this toolbox. When we're thinking about soil health, we're thinking about the uh, the life that is going on in the soil. So 
Uh, we're still learning about this actually. The, the diverse communities in the soil, uh, farmers are becoming more interested. Um, I think part of it is some of the, part of it is some of the uh, concerns that we've seen with, re with herbicide resistant weeds, with uh, corn rootworm that's becoming more resistant to some of our technologies, um, really making us go back and look a little more about what's, what's going on in the soil what can we expect um, the soil to provide for our crops uh, just by allowing it to function? All right, so our, our, our soils were developed over, over many years, um, always had a vegetation growing on them. Our, our prairie soils were developed under a, under a grass type vegetation. Our timber soils developed under a, a forest type vegetation. So uh, there is this functionality with soil and its interaction with, uh, with roots and with growing crops um, to really help improve its, its, its health is really the term that we, we've used. Uh, actually, we're, we're just trying to allow the soil to function how it normally wants to function. So a lot there. I, I hope I peeled that back just a little bit. Uh, definitely interested in talking about that more. Uh, Okay, we're thinking about, I mean, in, increasing the profits too within our goals. So, you know, what can we expect? Less passes across the field, uh, less, less tillage. Okay, so that's, um, till, tillage is often used ahead of crop production or behind crop production following it uh, to either prepare the soil um, for planting the seeds or for uh, doing some management of the residue that's left um, to get the residue in closer contact with the soil um, so that it can break down ahead of next year's crop. Um, there are a lot of things that we can do though without actually disturbing that soil, uh, that soil uh, structure and that soil profile, which I, I think we kind of learned about that just a little bit before about how soil wants to function. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't want us to, to come in and do aggressive tillage. Um, that disrupts the soil structure and disrupts the soil microorganisms. So. Can we, can we gain a little profitability by going less trips over the field? Uh, can we also improve our soil health, which is what, what I'm uh, advocating here and what I speak to farmers about. Okay, here's a goofy slide for just, just a minute. This was pulled out of a, a farm magazine, uh, kind of a neat, a neat little example of, of soil life. I haven't been bold enough to put this out in my own county yet, uh, maybe another year or so, but the, the, the concept here is that these, this cotton product that's used, as you can see, um, is, is put into the soil, okay? And a, a living soil, a soil with a lot of microbial activity is going to break that down. They're gonna use that cotton um, as a food source. They're gonna pull in nitrogen. They're gonna break it down, uh, create more sand, soil organic matter. So I, I mean, I, I think I know which, which pair I would, I would want to take, you know, pair, pair number four, or you could probably wash up and, and put, and put back in the cycle. And you can see that that's, that that's the one that had the most, um, the most tillage, the most disturbance of the soil. If I go up here to number one, uh, all we have left is the waistband basically. Um, and this one has more of that no-till cover crop soil health. So just kind of a fun little slide I wanted to share. Um, with this of, of this farmer and his children uh, trying to learn what, about soil health on their farm. Okay, a few wrap ups and we're gonna talk about safety then next. Um, think about maximizing profit. Uh, that, that, is, that is the goal. Um, not necessarily yield or bushels per acre, uh, not necessarily you know what's the lowest input cost that we can have, but how can we maximize profits? How can we find those spots to allow farmers to um, you know, really uh, make the decisions for their land and for their future uh, to help them be profitable? So the SNAP Plus tool, the nutrient management tool, definitely assists with that. Um, our, our, budget, our budget spreadsheet tools definitely assist with that as, as well. Um, taking a look at some of those new tech technologies, you know, are they essential or are they not? Uh, I, th I think that's a piece that we're going to keep doing more and more research on, and hopefully be able to provide those answers. And then the, the, the conservation piece. Um, anytime we're, we're dealing with, with agriculture, we need to be thinking about the conservation 
the building of that asset, that land asset for the future is, is really important. Okay, a few things we didn't talk about these quite as much, uh, but marketing a marketing plan when we're working with our crop producers, they often have the opportunity to to market their grains or market their products um, uh, at a little little bit wider of a window than some of our livestock products can be market. Our, our corn, grain, uh, soybeans, wheat, and such can be can be stored. We have a longer marketing window for those. Whereas uh, milk, our dairy, our beef, uh, swine, those, those products are more perishable. So they need to be marketed uh, a little, little, little bit quicker of a fashion. So we, we do have a few, a few different tools to help maximize profit. We're able to secure prices in the future, or we're able to um, secure a, a basis bid um, on, a, on a future cash market. Um, so we, we do have some tools there and just encouraging farmers to be uh, acceptive, acceptant of these, of these tools, um, to go ahead and try them. Um, any, anytime that we can market a product for a profit, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a, a win. Um, this is a few examples there about uh, leases and how important leases are when we're talking about land that's rented. Um, that's probably a whole nother discussion, but um, just wanted to share that that quick concept that um, over 50% of our of our land in the state is actually rented. So a, a crop a crop producer is renting that land. Uh, so really develops that that need and interest to have that conversation about the shared resource, uh, about that the uh, future conservation and the quality of the soil. Okay. Josh, um, not sure. Yeah. There's a there is a question in the chat. Yeah, I can read it to you. Um, Please. It said, "I saw a windmill in the background of one of your pictures. Is there any money in placing a windmill on your farm? Also, does having a windmill on your farm affect the soil in any way?" Perfect. Great question. So these windmills are are a, a different sort of energy, a different sort of um, you know diversity that, that farms can definitely take on. Uh, it, it really depends on the specific contract. Um, they're all just a little bit different, uh, but you know, just knowing knowing what's what's being offered and knowing what's available, um, there there definitely is an advantage, um, you know, to having that extra source of income. Um, as far as the soil, there is a fair amount of disturbance close to the wind, windmill site. What what I have seen, so so that pic picture is actually from a a 40 turbine farm here in Wisconsin, or excuse me, here in Lafayette County in one of our townships. And what I have seen is, is what I promote about soil and its ability to, its ability to uh, uh, come back to life and to repair itself. Uh, it's, not, it's not perfect yet, but it's, it's gonna come back if we can give it the right type of treatment. Uh, so, so Definitely something that I would encourage uh, land landowners. You know, if it's something that they would like to have on their land, these these are part of a part of usually a, a wind farm project. Though, um, oftentimes you've got to be located somewhere where that power then can go to a main a main overhead line and get and get moved then to a, a metropolitan area. And there was a follow-up question. Can you place a windmill on rented land? Who owns it when the lease is up? Okay. Uh, so windmills are cannot be placed on rented land. There is uh, usually a contract for the length of time that that windmill um, is going to be uh, placed on the land. So for instance, the ones in Lafayette County have a 20-year lease. After that point of time, the the investors that, that put in that initial investment for those windmills um, have the decision to make whether they'd like to refurbish the windmills, uh, sell that, reinvest in it. So there is a there is a reclamation clause built in too. After 20 years, if if the windmills are not going to be refurbished, there is a reclamation clause to to take them down and clean the area back up and put it back as close to normal as possible. My hope is that. Um, we would be able to bring in some new tech technology, utilize what's there, make any upgrades that's necessary, but continue to use them.
Good questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have about 20 minutes. I'm going to try to not use it all. Um, so we have time for a few more questions. I've got a few more slides to go through. So uh, I usually start tractor safety with these type of facts. So this is youth facts. Um, I don't have adult facts to share here today, but um, youth is one of the areas that we really focus on in um, tractor and farm safety. So this is the area that I had most of the information on. Um, just some really startling facts. And I, I, don't, I don't do this to, to scare the kiddos. Um, they're usually 12 to 14 year olds, but just, just to share the just to share what's what's going on in the farms across our country and what and what the risk is. All right, so every third day there is a, a death in agriculture. 48% um, of the fatal injuries, um, you know, within all occupations are within agriculture, and we're quite a bit more likely to be fatally injured in agriculture than other lines of work. A few more facts here. Um, every day, 33 youth are injured in agriculture. A um, few of the main causes, falls, animals, off-road vehicle use. Uh, common areas where injury happens, um, if we think about our arms and legs, right? And um, head in our, in our uh, middle chest area. So uh, livestock dairy farms at the top of the list, followed by crop farms. And perhaps you learned a little bit about that. Um, if you're part of the livestock portion, I actually pulled a few of those slides out, but um, we're really thinking about, you know, that that animal and the instincts of that animal when we're working with it um, is really what pushes some of the livestock and dairy farms higher on the list of risk um, compared to the crop production side, where we have a lot of risk of equipment and we have, uh, you know, other types of risks, but we don't have that instinct piece quite the same as we do uh, when we're working with livestock. So I I'm encourage everyone here today, um, you know, if, if and when you are out on farms or working on farms or talking to farmers, really choose safety. Uh, that's one of the main messages that I, that I share. And I think it just, it, it's something that we can do. Obviously, accidents are going to happen, but there's quite a few ways that we can choose safety for ourselves and others. So what are, what are some of those hazards? Can we identify a hazard? before we're directly in the middle of that hazard? Um, how, can we develop a plan to deal with it? So if, if we know there's a hazard, um, if, if we know there's a risk, how can we um, develop a plan to keep us and others safe? Um, what are the consequences before we make the action? And um, this audience is, is different from, from my normal audience, but I really, really ask them to think and consider, consider that consequence. Um, when I was when I was 12 and 13 years old, I, I don't know how well I was I was doing at that, right? But we just try to we try to encourage that and try to practice that throughout our class and when we do our practice driving as well. Um, try to uh, encourage encourage safe practice. So encourage work work habits that are safe. Um, personal protective equipment. Um, is, is important. Uh, we have some, a few things that'll be listed here in a, in a bit. And then I, I, I encourage the kiddos, and I'm gonna encourage that to others that are working in agriculture, working with farmers is, you know, speak up for your own safety. If you don't feel safe in a situation, uh, you know, speak up, make sure that the person you're working with or talking with, that they understand that you don't feel safe um, so that they can, they can change the situation for you. Same slide. Oh, I'm sorry. I was supposed to go through those one at that time. There we go. What is risk? Okay, we talked about the consequences, but we really need to understand what risk is and what some of the risks are um, on, our, on our farms, whether we're employed there, whether we're visiting a farm, uh, uh, whether we're growing up on that farm as a, as a youth. So the risk is that chance you take of becoming injured uh, by a hazard. Okay, so different hazards, different decisions have a different level of risk. Um, so it's, it's really based off of this probability and the consequence. So how, how often are you in that situation and what's the severity of that consequence? Really helps drive that amount of risk that's involved. So just a couple of examples here. And we can think about these. I, I, I know I didn't show you the, 
there's a chart coming up here, but if you could think about the risk exposure and the severity uh, entering and exiting a skid steer uh, under the boom. So what that means is the, the boom of the skid steer, um, if we raise it up above the door, often we're able to open that door and get out, but that skid steer boom, unless we have the safety lockout, um, is that it, we, we are at risk of something happening to that hydraulic system and that boom uh, quickly coming down on us. Okay, that's, that's example number one. Example number two, working with a new beef calf and its mother. We talked a little bit about the, the instincts of animals. Um, the, the instincts in motherhood in a, animal agriculture is, is really hard to predict. Certain mothers will act uh, in ways that, that we just don't expect. They could act completely differently from the way they were um, acting just the day ahead of, of giving birth. So, you know, what are some of the risk exposure um, consequences in those two scenarios? I'm going to show the answers. So if, if we enter and exit a skid steer under the boom, okay, so once we raise that boom up, if the safety lock isn't on, if we do that frequently, um, I'm going to suggest that there be a catastrophic result. Okay, the, the chances of living, um, you know, if that boom falls down on you, especially if there's any type of weight in the bucket, uh, would be would be really slim. Um, and, I, and I'm going to make this just a little bit different here for this example, we're, we're not handling and dealing with new mothers and babies maybe quite as often, especially if we're in more of a beef system where they're calving during a portion of the year. Um, so I'm just going to change that a little bit to more of an occasional risk if we're not around it every day, and perhaps the result wouldn't, would not be quite as severe. I'm going to put critical, um, but that could definitely be up for de debate as well. Okay, here's that chart. Probably would have been Josh, helpful. Go ahead. Before you, there's a question. Go ahead. Are all farmers with disabilities eligible to receive assistance regarding budget, soil management, leases, etc.? Does a person, family have to be farming a certain number of acres to be considered a farmer? Okay, uh, good questions. As far as, as far as any type of disability um, for, for our work with extension and also for the Farm Service Agency is also a USDA funded organization. We, we are really asked to, to um, go out and be very in, inclusive um, to, to all sorts of people, dis, disabled, um, uh, race, gender, uh, veteran, veteran status, so, so these programs are available for everyone. Uh, the, you know, being able to access them is really what our, what our goal is in extension is to bring that increased access. Uh, help me please, Amanda, with the other part of that question. Um, let's see here. It says, does a person or family have to be farming a certain number of acres to be considered a farmer? Okay, okay, yeah, so, so no. Uh, the, these these types of soil health practices and soil health uh, cost shares or cover crop cost shares yeah. are are available um, through yeah. lots of different okay are available through lots of different forms. Uh, there's some farmer led watershed groups in our counties that have some of this funding. Uh, there probably is a, a documentation of sorts if we're thinking about you know what is it to have, you know, what do we need to have to be a, to be a Schedule F on our taxes? So we would be considered a, you know, a farmer on our taxes, there probably is a category. But as far as owning land and putting into practice some of these crop production strategies, uh, you know, understanding the safety and realizing safety, you know, there, anyone can purchase a piece of farm equipment, you know, whether we're, we have a, a tractor and a loader or a maybe a three point mount mower to, to do some cleaning, um, you know, in part of our property, there, there's not a, a size that's necessary to be able to, you know, receive some of this information and help make uh, safe and well-educated dis decisions. Josh, can I interrupt you a second and just Please. pick on you a bit? Please. So I, you covered a few terms there that I know well, yep. uh, but that some people here may not so we talk about a skid steer with a loader bucket or loader arm um, you've talked about three-point hitches versus toad type hitches just verbally can you go through really quickly what those are and maybe how they're attached 
um, just just to under so so our, our attendees can understand maybe the physical implications of having to do some of that stuff. I, I know you've hooked up a three point hitch by yourself and and we can all I can't repeat the words that we generally use here when we have to do that. But uh, yeah, if you could just take a little time and go into a bit more detail about what you're talking about there. OK, thank you, Brian. Yep. OK, so. Uh, the, the, the pieces that Brian shared, a, a tractor uh, mounted loader. Um, this would be a, a loader that would mount between the, the front and the rear tires on, a, on, a, on a, one of our standard tractors. That's where the main load would be, would be carried for that loader. And then it would be out in front of the tractor most normally. So we could put uh, maybe a, a bucket on the front of it if we were going to push snow and the term bucket, what I'm thinking about, uh, if we um, see anything like around, like landscapers would have, you know, it's a, a metal bucket, almost the width, a metal uh, scrape bucket, the width of the tractor, and we can go ahead and pick up any type of material with it. Uh, we could also put on uh, pallet forks, so they would be metal, uh, metal lifting uh, uh, device. We could get under maybe a pallet or something heavy and pick it up. Um, that, that would be a front mount loader um, and it fits into the hydraulics of that tractor and we're able to raise it and lower it and tip it and roll it back. Uh, so some of the risks that are involved there are definitely being, being in a close proximity to that piece of equipment while it's being operated. Um, as far as hitching something to a tractor, um, a, rear, a rear hitch is usually hooked onto the, the tongue of the tractor. Um, so we have a metal, a metal draw bar that comes out underneath the tractor and that also goes back and is, is hooked on the center part of the tractor for st stability. And then we're able to, to back up to a trailer or a wagon and, and put a pin or some type of connection in there to hook that tractor to that wagon. Um, that would be a tow type hitch, whereas uh, a three point type hitch actually hooks right to the back of the tractor. There's, there's three arms. So it's three, it's three points of hookup. There's a bottom set of arms that, that do the lifting and then a top arm that, that stabilizes it. So we can, we can hook multiple things up to tractors from their three points or their normal toll hook, hookup. And uh, the risks associated with using these um, are diverse. All right, thank you. Uh, run through the rest of these slides here, or at least a couple more. So I use this chart with, with my tractor safety class and I'm sharing it here today is that we really want to stay out of this red category. Okay, if we're making decisions that are life-threatening, life-altering, if they're catastrophic and we're doing it frequently, there, there's, a high, there's a high risk that we're going to be injured compared to, uh, you know, if we're doing uh, a catastrophic type event, but we're not doing it as often, Okay, we're able to maybe plan a little more and we're not at quite as much risk. All right, that's the point there. Um, skip that one. A few things here that I just have down in Word um, to think about is how do we reduce and recognize some of our risky traits? So the decision making that we have, how do we recognize that and choose some of that safe equipment ahead of time? Um, one of those pieces is reaction time. Okay, just a few factors here to skim over. Uh, a, a PTO, all right, here's another term, um, power takeoff. Um, this would be power coming from the tractor, from the engine of the tractor to one of our rear mounted de devices, either a three point or, or a uh, draw bar attachment. So this power comes from the engine and it has as much power as the engine has as far as the ability to, to turn. Okay, so if we think of a piece of equipment that, uh, that we need to turn, like maybe a, a brush mower uh, or maybe uh, some type of a, oh, some, some type of a, a hay bind, some, something where we need to have that power, that turning power, um, it actually will spin um, almost five times in half a second on the, five, on the 540 speed. So I guess my, my take home point is most of the time, regardless of what our, what our factors are, our experience, our fitness, our illness, our, our distraction, our mood, 
um, a three quarters of a second reaction time is considered pretty normal, um, pretty highly functioning. Uh, that PTO already turned five times in, in half a second. So our, our ability to react um, is, very, is very slow compared to the speed to which our equipment works and our equipment spins. Um, so there are, there are risks being around some of that moving equipment. Um, and the, the PTO equipment is one of those major risks. Um, I'm going to skip through just a couple of these, um, more of this, this weather portion of farm safety, because um, I do want to talk about a few, a few other things here coming up yet. Uh, this is one that I, that I think really fits some of that planning piece of, of staying safe on the, on the farms. You know, how can we provide a, a safe working environment for ourselves, for any guests? Um, things that I really talk about and try to in encourage within the tractor safety class and then when, I, when I'm out on farms as well. Okay, kind of a fun, kind of a funny one here, at least I think it's kind of funny, but dr dressing appropriately for our, for our task. Uh, you know, we, we learned a little bit very briefly about, you know, all the power and the moving parts of this, of tractors and equipment. So, you know, how can we put ourselves at less, less risk of, you know, being pulled in or being injured? Um, try to encourage that farm work is not a beauty pageant. And there's a whole list of, you know, safety decisions here that we can make to help protect our, protect our bodies uh, when we're working on the farm. Uh, a few, a few things here too. I guess these are supposed to be a little bit, a little bit humorous as well. But uh, the the idea is to really have, to really um, respect the hazard signs that are being shared. Uh, they're they're on equipment and they're posted on farms for a, a for a reason. You know, read them, respect them, and respond to them is the encouragement that I that I share. Um, like I said, these are these are. Uh, goofy type signs, but there are, there are warning signs on all of our equipment, at least equipment that's been well kept. And those warning signs will, will help alert us to the areas that are most dangerous. Uh, perhaps there'll be signage when we enter a farm, you know, about areas that are, that are riskier for us to enter, maybe some of the manure storage area, or maybe the areas where um, there are some of those new, new calves um, or new uh, offspring, or maybe an area where there's some flowing grain, just pl places that we need to stay a little bit safer. Um, hand signals are used quite frequently on farms to help communicate between the person on the piece of equipment and the person on, on the ground. Um, it's, a, it's a different type of language actually. So uh, we, try, we try to learn what that nonverbal language is so we can work safely around each other. Uh, just a few more slides here to finish up. Um, P PPE is, is encouraged on farms. We talk about it in our pesticide applicator training classes. It's a little bit different type of PPE there, but we're really looking to try to you know, build that barrier between our bodies and whatever that, that risk is on the farm, whether it's you know, affecting our, um, our, our ability to, to, to hear over time, our respiratory health, or maybe you know, the ability of some of our other senses, how can we protect ourselves? And we really turn to, towards personal pr protective equipment to do that. Okay, first aid, just having some things available. Um, if there is, you know, if there is an injury on the farm, uh, some of that, some of that quick and available uh, supplies are really, are really important to, to help. Um, you know, always, always know when it's time to call and know, and know who those first res responders are. Um, when we're working on farms actively, it's it's important to know who we need to reach out to first in the case of an of an accident. Some materials here, um, like any standard first aid kit, um, the first aid that we have available and need on a farm are are definitely the same. Um, extensions here to help. I'm gonna I'm gonna put that out there um, to to the organization being represented today as as well. Um, we we've we definitely work with other agencies across the state. Um, farmers and agriculture are, are our main business, and we're, we're willing and able to help facilitate those conversations to, to help people re remain uh, safe while they're work working on farms, to, you know, to help uh, you know, 
develop those rela relationships. Uh, so please reach out, reach out through, um, through UW, through Brian and Amanda, and also then, you know, feel comfortable then to, to be able to reach out to us as well. Um, just a little bit of information here. If you do want to learn more, we have a crops and soils topic hub at UW. So it's cropsandsoils.extension. And then a personal extension website here in Lafayette County um, is lafayette.extension. Uh, so with that, that is, that is all I have. I know that was a ton, all types of things we talked about. I hope a little bit of it was helpful and beneficial. Uh, I'm not going anywhere till all the questions are answered. So if you have some more, let me know. If you have suggestions, anything, I would appreciate the feedback. Thank you, Josh. Um, it looks like there's just some comments that are saying thank you for the information. It was helpful and very interesting. So I haven't seen any questions pop up yet, but we'll give it another minute or so in case anyone thinks of anything. Yeah, great. No, happy to be a part of it today. Uh, definitely, uh, uh, hopefully I went in the right direction with some of the some of the thoughts and conversation. And thank you for the guidance of the questions and and uh, you know, man and Brian being on being on here today too. Josh, to give me a chance, you know, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, so ahead. you covered the the soil health and the and and everybody on here from yesterday knows I'm a machinery guy, so I'm I'm a little very much into the into the machine side of things. But when we talk about doing some of these operations, so you know what what does what's required. Um, you know, kind of thinking physically if you had to, and, and pick one, right? So let's say planting for sake of argument. Let's assume our planter's ready to go, you know, out of the shop, no, no maintenance there, but can you walk us through really quickly, you know, what it would take for you as a physically able person to get a planter to the field? What has to happen to make it work? including loading seed, et cetera, um, and then getting the job done. Just, just from a high level standpoint, you know, what is the step-by-step -step to plant one field? Can you answer that for me? Yeah, definitely. I'll give it, I'll give it a shot. So I had the picture of the autonomous tractor on there, and I guess there was another picture of a tractor and planter. Uh, so yeah, once that planter is hooked up and everything is working, like Brian mentioned, uh, we need to safely transport that to the field. Um, you know, oftentimes our, our newer equipment will, will fold down to a fairly narrow, narrow uh, size so we can get into our fields and then we get set back up in our field, our, our field width and such. Uh, but we, we do need to add, add seed, right? Whether we're planting whatever, whatever crop. Um, let's, I guess, think about a corn planter. Um, where we're going to plant in in rows maybe 20 30 or wider inch rows so the the seeds will be placed in those rows um, by the planter uh, we need to get seed into that planter um, some some planters will have individual boxes on every row um, so we can put the seed in a smaller box on every row uh, certain planters like the ones that i had had showed have more of a more of a batch type system where we, we put the seed into larger larger bins. So often that type of planting would require a little less physical uh, work as far as, you know, picking up those bags and dumping them into the planter. Oftentimes we can deliver that seed into that planter uh, with some type of a uh, piece of equipment, a seed tender is usually what it's called to move that seed into that planter. We may need to put uh, some type of treatment on it first, whether it's to help it flow better through the planter, maybe a graphite type type treatment. Oftentimes our, our seeds have any crop protection treatment on them all, already once they're delivered to us. Uh, and, 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 we, and we get the planter set in the field. If, if it's a little bit difficult for us to maybe get out of the tractor and check that, that would definitely be a place where we would want to reach out and have some help to make sure that we're getting our seeds planted at the right depth, um, that our planter is not skipping, uh, that's putting enough seeds down as it goes across the field. So uh, that, that, that's all the things that we're doing to get this planter into the field and get it set up. Uh, and once we, once we have it set up, then 
it's a matter of you know paying paying attention to what's going on in that planter. Uh, oftentimes, it's telling us. Um, are, are all of our row units working? Is there one not working? Um, we also may have some insecticide that goes on with the corn planter or some fertilizer. Um, so getting those systems set up so that it can deliver um, those products when we go across the field is also important. Does that, does that answer it a little bit? Yep, absolutely. And okay. sometimes just guessing in and out of the tractor to do that, five, six, yeah, 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 that's fair. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Yeah. So, and, and then we talk about other operations, not to belabor the point here, but, you know, basically every time we take a machine to the field, there's there's in and out of the tractor approximately five to seven times checking performance, this, that, and the other thing. So uh, the extended steps, the hand controls on the tractor, cameras, et cetera, that we identify as assistive technology, that sort of um, hopefully gives these folks a, a uh, idea of what it takes to it's not just jump in the tractor and go which is unfortunate because oh. I wish it was but <laughs> yeah I understand a little more now where your question's coming from Brian yeah. so yep I think you're I think you're spot on yeah the the tractors are are once we get in them they're often fairly comfortable and fairly operator friendly but they're they're a long ways off the ground and uh we we, we talk as tra tractor safety too just about remaining safe when you enter and exit a tractor uh you know a slip a slip from six or seven feet off the ground uh is is definitely dangerous thanks josh you bet thanks josh jeff did you have something you needed to say uh sure thank you so um, again, thank you, Josh, for the presentation. Um, I'm going to joke and say shame on Brian for asking you to um, explain front mounted loaders and rear mounted hitches and things like that uh, while staring at a computer screen, but you did it very well. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, uh, the one there was a chat regarding what um, how many acres qualifies a person to be a farmer. Yeah. And I think that my understanding is that USDA, the way they define it is very loosely in terms of um, a farmer's um, uh, is considered a farmer if they generate a thousand dollars of product per year. Um, and I, I, does that sound roughly correct, Josh? Yes. Yeah. You, you're de you're definitely right. There is a if you're applying for FSA programming. Yeah, there is there is some re requirements as well. Whether you're whether you're an operating farmer or or just simply a landowner. The um. The other thing was just simply again that um, you know that the presentation obviously we're not going to make persons experts in a one hour presentation but it was a nice overview for um, crop um, crop production in Wisconsin as well as um, hitting the hitting the points on the safety um, aspects which are also extremely important for um, youth and adults so thank you for doing that and um, appreciate your time Josh my pleasure. Well, all right. Thanks, guys. Well, I'm going to stop the recording now.